Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Isabel Ross, and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 175, we're narrowing down on the 200th, is my fifth interview with the brilliant author Matt Fitzgerald. I have previously interviewed him about his books 8020, which discusses the concept of running easy for 80% of your training and hard for 20%. How Bad Do You Want It, which delved into the topic of mindset and mental toughness. And the Comeback Quotient, which talked about <clears throat> athletes turning bad situations around. And then also his book called Run Like a Pro, Even If You're Slow, Elite Tools and Tips for Runners of Every Level. That was another awesome book, and they're all been brilliant. And his latest book is called On Pace, Discover How to Run Every Race at Your Real Limit, which is obviously all about pacing when racing, which of course you learn in training. I'm a big believer in racing by feel and you will be too after this interview. I'll post the link to Matt's book in the show notes so that you can get your own copy. Um, And I definitely recommend it. I loved it. You can also, I believe you can get it on Kindle, but I think it's also showing now that you might be able to get it in paperback. So watch that space. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. I really appreciate those of you who have taken the time to get onto Apple Podcasts to rate, review and subscribe to the pod. I read all of the reviews and they sure do inspire me to keep working on it. Thanks so much. I do really appreciate it. If you enjoy this episode, do me a solid and go on over and rate, review and subscribe. Also, don't forget to go to my website, peakendurancecoaching.com.au to get on my email list so you can get my newsletters full of interesting articles and tips or to get on board with coaching, of course. That's what I do, as well as do the podcast. (laughs) Also, don't forget to go on over to Peak Chocolate to get 15% off their amazing range of healthy chocolates that support your lifestyle and training. It's nice, I reckon, to have something sweet every day and also to know that you're not ingesting heaps of sugar. Join me in enjoying the delicious taste of Peak Chocolate by going to their website. The link is in the show notes. And don't forget to support health and high performance awesome at helping you with all those little niggles enjoy the interview with matt hi matt and welcome back once again the peak endurance podcast great to be back Yes, so you've put out, and, and you seem to come on quite regularly because you seem to write quite regularly. I honestly don't know how you do it. I've, I know I've said that before, but I, I think it's amazing. Um, I think everyone within themselves wants to write a book, but then um, the actual doing of it is is a hard task. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've done it many times, so I I know as well as anyone how, how hard it is. Um, but, you know, What's different for me is that I, I really grew up wanting to write books. Yeah. You know, my 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 dad is a writer, so um, you know this is you know I, I was born to do this. So it's still hard, and yeah. and I still find a way. After each book, I'm like, okay, this next one will be easier because I've got so much practice, and it really just never <laughs> is. But yeah. it's it's the only thing I'm any good at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't believe that. Now, um, this latest book is all about pacing and pacing for races. Um, so what was your um, motivation for writing this book? Uh, you know, a couple of different motivations. One is is practical. You know, as a, as a, a running and triathlon coach, um, I am aware that pacing is an important part of, uh, you know, both training and particularly racing um you know it's it's probably the biggest key key, uh, key to execution uh we put a lot of focus on planning but but you know maybe take our eye off the ball of of execution and and pacing is really at the core of that and getting it wrong is co- has consequences and in my experience you know the the average recreational endurance athlete has some room to improve in pacing. So there's a practical reason, but also on another level, I just find the phenomenon fascinating. It's, it's one of those things that's so familiar, you kind of take it for granted, but if you take a deep dive into, you know, what it's, what it really is and how it works and how you get better, 
you know, you would think, how can you write a whole book about it? And and people have said this, but you know, I could. Um, and you know, I think it actually. I always write things that I that I would read myself, and and I, you know, quite apart from the practical takeaways that I hope are in there for people. You know, I know you're going to be spending a few hours with it, and I I hope it's an enjoyable and interesting read for people as well. Well, I certainly um find it that way, as I find with all your writing is that it's um. It's it's I'm learning, but it's not in such a highly technical way that I have to struggle right. with the learning. So that's what I really love about your books. Now you say pacing is everything in competitive distance running, um, and yet we often don't think about pacing until you know a couple of days before race day, do we? Right. Yes. Yeah. That's just it. You know, it's it's kind of taken for for granted and. Mm. You know, like, you know, my message is that, you know, here's here's something new to be completely obsessed about. Like, it's like, oh, goodness, I, I just I just learned to be obsessed about how I breathe. Now I got to learn. Focus <laughs> up. No, not at all. And I, I actually I admit in the book that one of the mistakes I made early on when I when I decided to sort of make pacing more of a point of e- emphasis was, um, you know, I think it's easy if you when you do start to focus on it, to focus on or to, you know, to really be aware of where you're falling short of perfection. And that can sort of like, you, no one wants to feel like they're failing in every workout. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and for me, like, you know, training should be fun and working on pacing actually is, if you do it right, it can be a lot of fun. It's a way of like, just adding a, like a, like a gamification element to the training you're already doing. You don't have to make extra time for it. You're just sort of doing you're multitasking, like you're getting the physical benefit of the, of the workout, but you're also being intentional about uh, working on this skill at, at the same time. And, you know, again, if you do it right, it, it can and should be fun um, and beneficial. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I've, I've throughout my running have, have sort of gamified it. Like I'm not going to look at my watch until I I estimate that I've run a kilometre and then I'll check it and those right. sorts yeah. of things. Yep. Um, yep. Which, um, you know, I find has always helped me. And I tend to, um, when I'm racing myself, prefer to run by feel and what I feel is the correct pace rather than by, by what my watch says. But I, I notice, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same, and you sort of intimate it in the book or say it in the book, that a lot of people rely a lot on their watches for determining yep. their pace. Yep. Um, so do you want to just talk to us about that? Yes, Um you know, I've I, I've said in, in a couple of the interviews I've done in support of this book that you know I I started running in 1983, so long before there were these you know fancy GPS watches, um, and I used to wish that they existed, you know, before yeah. they did because I knew how useful they would be. You know, I, I go back to the days when, you know. You know, dad would get in the car and use the odometer, you know, yeah. in, in in the family sedan to measure out routes. Um, and and so they are a very useful tool. And like I said, like when when they didn't exist, I, I wish they would. But like a lot of tools, it, be- it can become a crutch. Um, you know, there's this uh, psychologist referred to the phenomenon as cognitive out, outsourcing, which is like when you find an external tool that can do something your brain normally does for itself, your brain gets lazy and it yeah. becomes dependent on that tool. So, you know, like, you know, my point is not that we should all throw our garments into the ocean. It, it's that quite honestly, and it sounds counterintuitive, but it's true that the, the runners, the athletes who benefit from their device the most are the ones who need it the least. So what you're really using this tool for is to not need it. That yeah. doesn't mean like you, you never graduate. You, you always, you, there's always some use for it, but you're using it to calibrate your sense of your own limits. And it is actually extremely useful for that. So you, you always want it, but you should be less and less and less dependent on it as you go. Yeah, I, I talk about that with my athletes, like using the watch so that you can say that's what that pace feels like so I know the exactly. feeling of it as opposed to I've got to hit that pace. And then I tell them right. to sometimes just do them by effort. And and is that kind of what you're meaning? Yes. Yeah, there, there's a balance, um, you know, because, um, you know, what you're really trying to do is is calibrate the subjective against the objective and and you know both are critical parts of 
you know, the, you know, our sports are like all our sport, like all sports is based on measurements, like performance is measured. So you can't just tune that out and go completely by feel. And there's actually science showing that like paying attention to numbers actually helps us stretch our limits. But ultimately as endurance athletes, our limits are defined perceptually. Like you, you can't go any faster than you feel you can. Yeah. And, and so you, you can't, you can't tune out that, that piece either. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, every race you do, is unique. And, and so like, there will never be some fancy calculator that can say, here's what you can do today. Now go and do it. Like <laughs> it, it don't work like that. You know, it's like any other type of performance. It's like, it's on you to a cert certain extent in the moment, which is, it can feel onerous and a little bit daunting if you're not that good at pacing, but it's also, it opens up the possibility to have a competitive advantage because if it's hard for everyone, then you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be a, a little bit better than the people you're competing against. And that's a lower bar. Yeah. 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 And, and you say that because um, pacing is the one thing that you, you can improve when you, when you've stopped getting those speed gains and all that sort of stuff, pacing can be one thing that you can work on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, the, it's really sort of, uh, you know, it's, I mean, there's really no definition of, perfect pacing like you know yeah. you can't finish a marathon and look back i mean if you made an obvious mistake in your pacing then you know but like if you run you know you know a really good race you can't look back and say for certain that you couldn't have gone three seconds faster if you'd done something somewhere you know what i mean it's like yeah. it, it's it's unknowable um so because it's unknowable it, it means that you can probably always get better than you are um, and you know, your body's not just going to keep getting stronger and stronger as you get older, right. but that skill is something, and we know for sure that it is experience based and that, and that it is learned, you know, because everyone really messes up their pacing in their very first, you know, attempt at any type of, you know, quote unquote, en endurance race. So, mm -hmm. you know, like experience is, is unfolds in the medium of time. So yeah, you, you can keep, you know, it doesn't it's not automatic. That's why you know, I really think you do have to be intentional about it. You don't just like keep running and automatically get yeah. better. You keep running and consciously work at getting better at pacing and you do. And so do you think that, you know, how you talk about experience, do you think that doing like practice racing, practice races would, would be beneficial or are you talking more just using it in training? You know, it's, um, you know, there is a specificity factor. So like you, you certainly, to, you can only get better at racing through training to a certain extent. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you can only race so often. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so there's a balance there. You have to really mostly rely on, on training. Uh, uh, Cause really, you know, you know, pacing is important in, in training, but more for the sake of ensuring that you get the intended benefit of each workout you do. Um, so, you know, it, in that sense, pacing is important in the moment in, in training, but you're also trying to get ready to execute in a different way. Like, you know, presumably you're never really testing your absolute limit in training. So, yeah. you know, by definition, uh, the racing is, is a special experience. And so, yeah, to that extent, you need to accumulate a certain number of races, you know, to get specifically better at that. But but even that isn't automatic. So like it's it's really, you know, it's it's reflection. It's being mindful during experience and reflective on experience that gets you better on it, not just the experience itself. Yeah, so thinking thinking about it in the moment as well as later yeah. sort of thinking about it. So if we pace a race, you know, as perfectly as we can, what are we looking at? Yeah, I mean, the you know, the watchword for, um, you know, successful pacing in, in endurance racing is consistency. I mean, that that's what we find. And, you know, it's easy to to point out, well, it's not absolute perfect consistency. Like, you know, you're, you're going at exactly the same pace or exactly the same power output from start to finish, like no deviations whatsoever, not even for topography. It's like, well, that's, that's <laughs> not the case. 
But I mean, what 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 you know the science and the real world evidence suggests is to the extent that people mess up their pacing and they don't succeed in the goal of completing the race as a whole in the least time pass possible, it's because their pacing pattern over the course of, of the race is more erratic and less mm -hmm. consistent than that of the people who finish, you know, getting, you know, close to 100% of, of their potential out of their bodies on that day. So you're trying to sort of move in the direction of, of being more consistent. And, you know, it makes sense, like, you know, physiologically is that, you know, you know, you, when you're, when you're trying to distribute, you, you just have a certain amount of energy that your body is capable of expending over a, a certain distance on a certain day. And, and so you have in, in order to succeed in like, and, you know, but it's not automatic. Just, I mean, the obvious example is like, imagine if you start a marathon at a dead sprint. So you're, you're, you're putting a lot of your energy in up front. Well, you're, you're not even going to finish no. the marathon. So, so anytime you, you go over that threshold of what is truly sustainable for the full distance, you know, you're, you're burning matches and you only have so many matches to burn. So you just, you don't, you want to sort of, you want to find the limit and ride the limit, but you, you have to be very, very careful not to exceed the limit because then you'll actually spend more time below it than you do above it as a result um, because yeah. it's just not, it's not a linear thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, you see that a lot in races, people going out super hard. But I've also heard people sort of saying that they're trying to bank time. Right. What do you think about that theory? Yeah, you know, it it just doesn't work. You right. know, it's, I mean, you know, the, the people, it, you know, it is intuitive to a certain extent. And, and there are probably, you know, there are probably parallels outside of distance running where that sort of strategy is effective like you know you just you get a fast start on saving for retirement and, and then you know you end up you know with a lot of money to retire on that you know that makes sense so it's not like the psychology is dumb mm -hmm. um but it it in in when when push comes to shove like the evidence shows it just doesn't work in distance running that you end up you know you, you end up losing more time later on as a result of, of that effort to, to bank time. So, you know, it's, it's really, you know, because again, it's like, it, it's also as much, if not more psychological as it is physiological. So um, I've, I, I wrote about this. It's actually, you know, not really focused on in the book, but in, in a subsequent blog post, I talked about, you know, what you really kind of want to do think about it in terms of like how you experience your race is you know the closer you, anyone who's done more than a couple of races knows knows this like you know like a marathon distance is kind of unfathomable like even if you've done a bunch of them like when when you're when you're two miles in or mm -hmm. you know you know f you know three k into a marathon it's like I just know I have a long way to go you, you know um, but the closer you get to the finish, like the deeper into a race you get, the more sure you are, you just, you can feel it happening. It's like, at, at first you're like, I have no clue if this is sustainable, probably. Um, but you get further along and, you know, the fatigue starts to set in and you, the the, the distance becomes more and more fathomable. In a, in a sense, the race becomes shorter and shorter, the closer you get to the finish line. And then, then you, you can get to a point where like, yeah, I know, I know this is sustainable or, or I know it's not, and, and I need to back off. So what you're really trying to do is is um be just conservative enough that you actually when you get to that point when you're sure about what you have left you still feel really good because mm -hmm. like when that happens and I give the example in this blog post of uh, a world record that was sent set in the uh, women's ten thousand meters the the existing world record uh, twenty nine oh one um uh. And and that and and it, it was just it, this incredible negative split that the athlete ran. It was like fourteen forty two for the first five k, fourteen eighteen for the second five wow. k on the track. So just yeah. like she just she went just fast enough to 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 not lose her chance. And then once she got she was halfway through the race. Actually, she waited even deeper to seven k before she really started squeezing it down. But then she just went berserk because she. She she still had a chance, but she felt mm. fantastic. And 
that's sort of the like from a psychological angle, like that's the way you sort of want to look at it. So it's almost the opposite of banking time. Like it's a little mm-hmm. counterintuitive, but it's like, no, like don't dawdle. You need to go fast enough to give yourself a shot. Uh, but you want to get deep into the race feeling great. And then you can just kind of explode and, and negative split. Yeah. 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 And, and, but how do we learn that ability? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I think this is like, it's the honest answer, but it's also kind of, I would, I would expect that people would receive it as a kind of relief to yeah. hear it. It's that, you 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 learn it by messing up like <laughs> you learn it by getting it wrong um and, you know and the thing that people you know if you look at you know a, a, as an american I, I i like to give examples in in other sports like you know baseball and, and american football where you see some of the amazing displays of skill or even something like golf you know just where you know the you know the accuracy that the top players are w- w- with which they're, they're able to you know, drive and chip and, and putt the ball or, or in, 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 you know, in, in European fo- football, as you know, it uh, like, you know, some of like, you know, the, the penalty kicks, like, especially the indirect ones where they've got a wall of bodies in front of them and they bend it over their heads. And it, you know, just like, we look at something like that and they're like, Oh yeah, that person, the like, like we're, we're wowed by it because we know we can't do it ourselves, but like, we understand what exactly what it is. So it's like, oh yeah, like the person's not looking at a watch and and punching numbers into a calculator. They're just doing it by practice and feel yeah. and skill and experience. Well, pacing is exactly that. And and you can be it, it's hard like the, the the thing about like running is that like to to the observer, good pacing and bad pacing look the same. They just look like a dude running. <laughs> you know, so like you're you're not you're not able to just be as wowed. But yeah. the best pacers are just as jaw droppingly skilled as the David Beckham's who can you know just bend that penalty kick in, into the net. You can be incredibly like uncannily precise and pacing. Like I, I got about that good at it myself just through you know years and years and years of, of practice. I, I would scare myself sometimes like how how good at it I, I was. And it's just like and it it, it so it's doable, yes. but it like it, it's just a process. And the good news is you you get there by messing up. Like you know my first two marathons were disasters. Like I I I ended up walking in both of them through you know just like terrible pacing and, and, you know, you know, so many marathons further on, I just had so much confidence. Like I knew I was going to execute, like it was, I knew it was all on me and it didn't matter if the weather was weird or if I'd never seen the course before, or I I wasn't sure about my fitness, I knew I could figure it out. And I, and I did. And it's just, and I, I talk about this in the book, um, that part, that's part of it too. Just that feeling like I got this. Uh, yeah. Like th- that's a huge part of it too. Because I think I think a lot of runners when they when they approach pacing, they're just like that's why they are so dependent on their device. It's like I don't trust myself. <laughs> like I don't know. And, and what you're really sort of looking for is that is that confidence as much as like when you have the skill, you have the confidence. So you can almost think of it as like which comes first. Um, yes. But, 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 but if, if you're good at pacing, you know it, and it gives you this, this great feeling of confidence about your ability to execute. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, so therefore that pacing is, is the art of finding your limit. Um, when, when, you know, you often see, and, and I know we, you discuss this in the book, but if you can clarify it for the listeners, like people who, um, get to the end and they're absolutely tired, but then they can do that last minute speed spurt at yep. the end. How, what's what's the machinations behind that one? Yep. Uh, you know, that's what makes, um, you know, endurance racing, our sport, like really kind of different from, from others. Like the obvious comparison is, is sprinting. Like, yeah. um, you know, for me, the definition of endurance race is any race that is long enough such that the, 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 the best way to complete it in the least time possible is to, to you know, intentionally hold yourself back, um, yeah. you know, and until, you know, what the science, the science says, like you, you can only really sustain 
um, a maximal effort, you know, if you're trained for somewhere around 45 seconds, for most people, it's, it's actually closer to 30 seconds, like any race that's longer than that. So even, you know, the shortest, like an 800 meter race on the track is, is a distance race and it needs to be, uh, paced. Um, and, and so then, you know, then it becomes kind of like in a sprint, like a, you know, a, you know, a 60 meter dash or a hundred meter dash, like there's, there's no mystery about the limit in a sprint. It's like, it's like, it's like in, in running, it's, it's two things. It's l- rate of leg turnover. Like how quickly can you, you know, cycle your legs and it's, um, you know, directional force of impact on the ground. It's like, how hard can you hit the ground with your foot in the right direction? Like, that's it. That's all sprinting is like two, two variables. Like that's, that's your limit. There's nothing else going on. Um, in, in endurance racing, it's a lot fuzzier th- than that. It's like, I- I'm sorry, like the li- limit's kind of invisible to me. And we know like all kinds of psychological variables, like the presence of competitors, um, mm. caffeine intake, you know, how does that work? It reduces perception of effort so that your, your, what was your limit doesn't feel like your limit anymore. Like that's how it works. Like yeah. it just changes how things feel. So So because of that, because the limit is this fuzzy kind of invisible thing, um, then it really becomes um, as much cognitive as anything. Like you're you're just like, you know, you have to hold back. And uh, Sam Wellamarcora, an exercise physiologist, an Italian exercise physiologist, um, the the father of the psychobiological model of endurance, like he, he, he explains this really well. It's like there's actually two jobs in pacing. And the, and the one we think about, like, as, as the only job, like, you know, getting to the finish line as quickly as possible is actually secondary to the first job, which is getting to the finish line. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like, like you really, so that's like it forced, because that really is job number one. You don't want to blow up and fail to get there. It forces you to be a little bit conservative. Like you, you have to, like, you have to err on the side of making sure you can get to the, the, the finish line. Um, and because of that, like, presumably you're holding back enough so that, you know, when you get close enough to the finish line and, and you're like, okay, now it doesn't matter anymore. Like, you know, I can do anything for a minute and yeah. then yes, yeah. you're able yeah. to muster some kind of end spurt. I, I will say like, you know, I, I, I think in like, it, you know, if, if, it, you know, I've just said there really is no such thing as a, a or we, like the, we don't know what a perfectly paced race is, but I think, you know, if I just pretend I didn't say that and say, here's what is a perfectly paced race. It's when you go to do that finishing kick and you're, if you are able to speed up, it's only a very little bit because you really have emptied out the tank. Um, so you have enough left but you have just enough left, like with an absolute all out effort and, you know, with the finish line in sight, you're only able to speed up a little bit like that to me says you, you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that sounds right. That sounds good. What is the, um, especially because, you know, like a lot of the listeners to this podcast do ultras, you know, so hundred Ks, hundred miles, what does the effect of brain fatigue have on um, our ability to pace? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And it, it has, um, it has a, it really has a couple of uh, different effects. Like one is, you know, like your brain, as you and I sit here talking to each other, your brain is using 20% of the energy that your entire body is using. So like, you know, it's, your brain is an energy hog. It's doing most of the work most of the time. And when you're, when you're running, it's also using 20% of your energy, but like the total energy expenditure is greater. So, you know, when, and and so your brain gets tired, like, you know, as you just intimated and when it gets tired, I mean, it's the thing that's making your muscles move. (laughs) So when when your brain gets tired, it can't make your muscles move as well. So if you just, if you leave it, I'll, I'll get to the second part, but like the first part is just that, like, like you just like, it, it's, you know, it really is, you know, we think of like our muscles as our engine, but well, I guess maybe our brain is the furnace or something like it just like everything starts there. So that's one thing which happens in ultras more like, and that, and there's science shows this, the longer the race, 
the more it really is quote unquote central fatigue that is the story versus peripheral fatigue and in, in the extremities and and so the second thing is that you know um pacing is cognitively and emotionally demanding like um when, when you're especially in ultras i I've, I've done a few and they're you're, you're spending a long time in a lot of discomfort and and that is emotionally difficult like you have to regulate your emotions um and like you can only do that for so long you know some psychologists refer to it as ego depletion it's just like you're <laughs> you're, you're, like, you're like your will your willpower has, has a, a limit um mm -hmm. and sometimes like you know i the one uh, ultra i dnf'd in it was like i could feel it like i was through emotionally i was i was through that's why i dnf'd yeah. um and so it's really hard because because your limit is largely you know just psychological in nature like if you lose heart you you will feel like your limit is closer than if you're still emotionally in a good place so that that's another piece and then then there's the cognitive part which is like you are basically doing biological math when you're you're pacing like you you're consciously you have conscious knowledge of how far you have left to run and you and you are able to consciously perceive your your level of fatigue and then you have uh sort of embedded memories of all the past experiences you've had running so you're able to like put together your conscious knowledge of the distance remaining how you're feeling now and make an assessment like is this sustainable or not and when you're when your brain is really tired you're not as good at that mm -hmm. anymore you know you're just like i i don't know i'm <laughs> So yeah, it, it's like, it's all the more challenging in those, those ultra yeah. distances. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what about, you know, when you're talking about pacing, like it's, it's kind of easier to pace when you're running on a flat course. <clears throat> How do you think about pacing when, because a lot of these ultras are in the mountains, when it is in the mountains and you've got to factor in uphills, downhills and so on. How do we think about pacing then? Yeah, it do definitely does add a, a wrinkle. Um, you know, it, it, that's where, you know, I've made references to physiology, psychology. Now I have to throw in physics because, um, <laughs> you know, it really is. It's a matter of physics. Like, um, you know, you, you, you like a, a human being can push harder uphill yeah. than they can on, on the flat and they can't push as hard downhill as they can on the flat that's physics like in, in like in an, an entirely uphill race you can actually expend more energy over a given period of time than you can in, in a flat race forget yeah. an equal distance i'm talking about equal time yeah. um and so it you know i you know this is the part of the interview when i contradict myself but you know before <laughs> i talked about cons consistency and it really is true like like you that is the watchword um, and even on a super hilly course with a lot of up and a lot down, a lot of down, the, the people who do the best job of executing are the most consistent, but you are not aiming for total consistency in effort um, on a hilly course. So you should be putting out more effort. Of course, your pace is going to slow down. Mm -hmm. And but so there's a balancing act, like if it's like on a steep, um, a steep climb, you know, imagine what it would take energy wise to sustain the same pace, <laughs> you know, the same velocity as you were standing on the flat. Like that would be a terrible idea. Like that's too, that's too big a spike in energy, but your energy should go up. So you're sort of making a compromise between, you know, preserving your pace and, uh, and, you know, saving some energy for what, for what comes after. So the energy level should spike, but, but within reason, um, and then going downhill, same, same deal. Like you're, you're, you're trying to, um, you know, use gravity mm -hmm. and, and not just sustain the same pace as you would on the flat, but actually go faster than you would on the flat. But you're not trying to, you're not trying to achieve the same level of energy expenditure as you would on the flat, because that would really require something that felt completely awkward and would, could yeah. even hurt um so it's just again it's like one of those things um where you know some people they look at the hilly courses and they're like 
they're daunted and others are like, sign me up. Like this is where <laughs> I shine. So it's yeah. just another one of those things where it can, it can be, you know, a relative advantage for you if you get good at, at pacing on hilly courses. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, obviously just practice on hilly courses. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Now, what are some mistakes that, that people make? You know, they create this pacing plan and, and that sort of stuff. You sort of go in the book into what some yep. of the mistakes are that people make. Yeah, I mean, you know, not making a plan is actually <laughs> one of them or or yes, like definitely. or just, you know, it's sort of like an arbitrary or a thin plan or it comes together late, you know, like the whole round numbers thing. It, it, you know, you know, so, like you know, I, I I give an example in the book. I don't know exactly what it is, but like, you know, if you're if you're, you know, training for a 5k and you know, if you're paying attention, your training tells you you're ready to, you know, maybe run 2045. But that person, because they're not really paying attention and, you know, round numbers are these bright, shiny objects, they might say, my goal is to break 20 minutes. And what they end up doing is running 22 minutes because 20 minutes wasn't sustainable. 2045 should have been the goal. It's like, you know, you you might be able to get to that 1959 or, or whatever it is, but not in this not in this 5k yeah. um so that's one thing just like bad planning um and then you know once it, like assuming you do have a good plan uh you know the two sort of executional mistakes are um sticking to the plan too much um and i give an example of the the american ultra runner jim walmsley and in, in uh the uh, uh western states 100 you know one year when he just he really wanted to not just win, but break the course record. Uh, but the conditions were just brutal that, that year. And, and everyone knew it. And, and the other athletes, the ones who ended up beating him, <laughs> uh, adjusted. Uh, but Jim didn't, he's like, this is my goal. I'm going for it. And, and, you know, so, and, and, you know, I think a lot of runners can relate to that. Just like they, they have a plan and no matter what happens <laughs> on, on race day, they're, they're sticking to it. It's like that. No, the goal is to do the best you can, all things considered. And so that means you need to consider all things, <laughs> including like the conditions of the course, the weather, um, you know, what your body has that day. Yes. We all opened up this, you know, this mysterious black box on race morning and we have no idea what we're going to find inside. We have some idea, but like never exactly. So you yeah. have to be responsive to, to the moment. So, you know, um, you know, sticking too much to plan is one mistake. Um, and then not sticking enough to plan is the other, exactly the opposite. Um, and, um, you know, where you just, you know, the classic example is, is a marathon. When you think, you know, what you're capable of, you have a goal and you just get caught up uh, like you feel great. And like if, you know, if you're fit and ready, who doesn't feel great in, you know, in the first 5K. Right. And there's all these people around you. If it's a larger marathon, everyone's stampeding. You just get yeah. caught up. Um, and so that's like, a, you know, a failure to to stick to the plan. Um, so sometimes I, I like to put it. This is the way I experienced it myself with some of my own you know, lessons learned the hard way in pacing. It's like the you who made the plan is not the same you who executes the plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you need to account for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You're right. And and 100% like what you said that, you know, you never quite know what you're going to feel like come race morning. It could be, you know, your body feels great, but, yep. you know, there's so many variables and that's why you need to be able to adjust and and like you say doing the training and, and working on it will help you yep. you also talk about macro pacing can you explain yep. that to to the readers this is one i'm really i'm really big on this one i think it's so important right on cool um yeah that's the the last chapter of the book aside from the the training plans yeah sort of the pacing focused training plans at the back and um you know macro pacing for me is just it's it's pacing so, you know, the, the scientists, uh, you know, uh, you gave my definition of pacing, which is the art of finding your, your limit. Like, you know, the, the more scientific definition of pacing is uh, the goal directed distribution of, and management of effort in an exercise bout. So the, the, like those last words are, are key an exercise bout. So that's that's one session of exercise. Right. So like if you've showered and changed like that's more than one exercise about, right? Yeah. <laughs> so like one workout, one race, but pacing is also, and we can all relate to this, just um, 
Pacing is something you can do on broader time scales as well. You know, we've all had periods in our lives when we were everything we were going very quickly and there was a lot going on and we, we were juggling a lot of balls and things were hectic. And we've had other periods that were more mellow and lazy and fallow. Maybe we're just like on vacation or recuperating from one of those periods that was really hectic. And so there, that is what macro pacing is. You know, it's a, it's like pacing on a broader time scale, and it, it becomes really important. So there are some differences, obviously, right? But there are also some some key similarities, and and there's just as much benefit, if not more, in getting good at at macro pacing. And and I give the examples of of athletes who have had sustained greatness. Um, you know, who don't just find their peak, but they stay there. You know, um, uh, yeah, I give the example of the the American runner Abdi Abdi Rahman, who qualified for five Olympic teams for for the U.S. Uh, the fifth one at age forty three, he qualified for the wow. Tokyo Olympics in the marathon. Yeah, just incredible. Mm-hmm. And and it, when you study these, because the, the, you, know, you can look at that and say, wow, he like he's defying time. Like, no, he's not. <laughs> like he like he he's good at macro pacing. And, and like when you look at um, uh, Sarah Hall, another American runner, is another example. She's not as old yet, but she she's well. She, she's in her late thirties and just seems to keep getting better. And the secret is the same. If you look under the hood at what they're doing, like you know, it's a lot of the same stuff. Like just having a lot of balance in their life, like keeping the joy in in, in their running, uh, never letting themselves go too much um you know just like in the, the periods when they're like you know decompressing they don't completely just go off the rails <laughs> um and then you know just never pushing too too hard on the other side as well just like um you know the the, the phrase you hear out of the mouths of these athletes very often is chipping away yeah. like they're ch- chipping away at progress it's just sort of methodical steady but with a lot of fun mixed in and enjoyment because that's cre- cre- uh, that's critical you like you know, keeping the passion alive. Like if you want to be better at 43 than you were at, at 23, well, you better still be loving <laughs> yes. real running at that age. Yeah, that, that is so true. Yeah. And and I think, um, I mean, you see a lot of athletes come into running and, and they just really burn hot for a little while and then and then it's over, which it seems such a pity when when really you can have a long running career if if you pace correctly. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell people like, it's your sport. Like and if you want it to be, you know, a short thing for you, fine. Like you, it's, it's your choice, but um, you know, the, it's the, the real tragedy is when you keep pushing past when the thrill is gone, like you're still yes. trying to achieve and your heart isn't it. That's a tragedy. Yeah. Like if you just said, you know what, you know, I've, I had my fun. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to pickleball now. Okay, great. Um, you know, but if you're going to keep putting a lot of work into it, like, like it, it really is important to, to, to love it. Oh, I agree. I mean, because running does take a lot of work and, and it's not always fun in the moment work. So you've got to love it overall. Yes. Yep. And like you said, you've got, um, workouts in, in the last, you know, few chapters for different, you know, you know, 5k, 10k, half marathon, marathon. Um, can you give us an example, probably from marathon, training what's a sort of a work guide that we can do that that you know helps us with learning pacing yeah i mean there's there, there's a there's a there's a wide variety of, of them um yeah. you know and, and some of them are just ways of gamifying uh the training process like one that i'll just throw out it, it's maybe you know you know not the most exotic example but perhaps maybe like like if if to give some people something immediately actionable um uh, that I use with with runners who struggle with their endurance, where they're like, you know, they're they're bonking in marathons because they're bonking in their long runs in yeah. training. So I, I, when when I identify one of those athletes who just seems to peter out even in training, uh, I impose a rule that I call the the fastest mile last rule. And if so, if you're on the metric system, fastest yeah. kilometer last. Um, so the rule is like in every longer run you do your last split has to be the fastest of the entire run now it can only be by one second or two and actually that's preferable like you're not yeah. trying to just kick Sprint. to the finish yeah but the the whole purpose of that exercise is like 
when I when I tell when I simply tell a runner in qualitative terms, like you need to start your long run slower so that you don't slow down involuntarily at the end, yeah. they won't do it. They'll be like, okay, got it, coach. I'll start slower. And then they do the same thing again. Yeah. But when I turn it into a little game, it's like your last kilometer or mile has to be your fastest. That that clicks. And, and the whole yeah. purpose of it is to get them thinking about the end at the beginning. Cause that's yeah. what good pacers do. Like they're, they're comprehending the entire, it's not, you know, I'm 2k into the marathon and I feel awesome. I'm going to go faster. It's like, like, no, like a, a great pacer is thinking about the finish line. Yeah. To, I mean, to, you're, you're running the mile you're in, as they say, but like, you, you're sort of like, you're not losing sight of how much is left in front of you. So that, that is a really helpful tool. And it's just one, like, like one time ain't going to cut it. Like, but like you need to make it a practice where it just becomes a habit where you just, yeah. cause if you train to slow down, that's what you're going to get good at. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Because yeah, you get what you're trying for, don't you? Yes. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great work. Kind. And, and yeah, it's, it's simple, but it's highly effective. Yep. Especially with a lot of repetition, as I say. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. So um, listeners give that one a try. If you're running now, <laughs> Try that. <laughs> All right, exactly. Well, yeah. Now, when does your book come out here in Australia? Yeah. That. So, you know, what's interesting and new and different about this one is that I am the publisher of this ah. book. So, yeah, my company, 8020 Endurance, um, uh, we, we just, you know, because I like to write a lot of books, <laughs> as we discussed, and it just, it, you know, you know, it just made sense. Like we just yeah. decided to start our own book publishing imprint. So it's not exactly self-published because it's, it's a real company and we will okay. publish books by, by other authors, but like, this is like the initial release. So we're sort of inventing the wheel uh, yeah. here um, in terms of like, you know, our distribution systems and such. Um, so I, the, the, all this to say, I don't actually know the answer to, to, <laughs> to, that, to that question. Like, I know it's available in a lot of places in a lot of formats, but not everywhere in all formats. Like, um, and we, we'll, we'll have an audio book, but we, we don't have one yet. Um, so, yes. um, yeah, we'll, you know, we're a global, I mean, our, the main 8020 Endurance is a global company. And so we want, you know, athletes everywhere to also be able to access the, so the if they went onto your website, would would people be able to order it from there? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can definitely get it anywhere, but it's at this point, it, it has to be shipped from yeah. the the US, and um, uh, yeah, so it just, you know, this 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 was to be expected. Like we're, you know, the first time through, you're like, because yeah. you know, we're we're trying to break, we're actually trying to break the system a little bit, like. If you look at like this is getting a little bit into the how the sausage is made, but like <laughs> self publishing is set up for people who sell, you know, three hundred books and lose money. Like yeah. that's not what we're about. But so we're using systems that were set up for small timers to try to do something big time, and and we're pushing up against the limitations of them. But like, but. You know, ultimately, ultimately, there's um, real potential here to create to sort of have it both ways to have the control, yeah. but also have it just be like as professional and as well oiled a machine as you know the the the, the big players in, in book publishing. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always with the first time for anything, there's always some teething issues, isn't there? So, yes. all right. Well, um, I will. I'll still give a put a link to your website in the um in the show notes and people can, you know, look into to getting the book because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who are interested in this because, as you said, there comes a limit to all your other training and this is one thing that you can definitely work on forever, really. Yes, and I, I should I should add, you know, for the benefit of uh, your, your local listeners, um, that the first chapter is available for free online as well, so including awesome. a, a link to that as well. Yes, that um, would be great. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And um, just so you know, the top rating um, episode on my podcast is is my interview with you on 8020 running. So right there you on. Go. Yes. So thank you. I am, <laughs> Let's see how this one goes. That. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, that is really cool. So thank you so much for joining us once again. And um, I look forward to hearing what your next book is. Yes, it won't be long, I can assure you. <laughs> That's great. That's great because I, I love reading them, so it's all good. All right, thanks so much. Thank you.